All right, welcome to the fourth edition of the Stinti's Rules of Acquisition. This is rule of acquisition number two, the anomaly tell. Anomalies are the mother of scientific progress, and necessity is the mother of technological progress. Uh, the an, an anomaly indicates that there's something wrong or incomplete with scientific theories or models. Anomalies can include such things as wrong answers, which are also known as counterexamples, ambiguities, and we're not going to get into detailing all these because ambiguities have spun off into their own rule of acquisition. Rule of acquisition 17, the ambiguity tell. And then there's paradoxes, which are also contradictions. Uh, un unverifiable answers, in other words, dark matter. You know, we've got this answer that there should be dark matter, but we can't find it. Maybe we just don't know how to measure it yet. Don't know, but that's an, I, that's a, I, this is an example of something that's not verifiable yet, if it, it will ever be verifiable. Nonsense things, inconsistencies, and asymmetries. Now, these here with the little asterisks pretty much mean these aren't, these aren't hard. In other words, um, just because something is nonsense now doesn't mean it's... It, 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 may, it may be nonsense because we don't understand it right now. But if it is nonsense, we should look at it. Because if it's nonsense and we figure it out, well, then it's not nonsense anymore and we've advanced technological progress. So in reality, it is hard, because if it doesn't make sense now, then that gives us a reason to go look at this deeper to make sense of it or to find out if it's garbage. Okay, so even though this isn't a hard one, it doesn't necessarily mean the theory or model is wrong. It basically means that we should go look at it deeper because there's something to be learned here if it makes no sense right now. Uh, same with these. An asymmetry is not a hard uh, rule of acquisition tell. It's just, you know, why is it asymmetrical? You know, does it make sense if it's asymmetrical? In other words, it gives us a reason just to go look. So about the rules of acquisition. The rules of acquisition were originally started as a kind of tongue-in-cheek humor thing to make the original EMV series of uh, videos a little less dry. Uh, they soon evolved into a series set of rules that are, are actually driving this initiative. And this is the fourth edition of these rules. These fourth edition rules supersede any prior edition of the rules. The rules include tells, which are a way to determine if something's there or not there. Fallacy, which means it's a false thing we believe. A paradigm, a way to do or view science. A trap, which is like a mental trap, a way we can get ourselves caught up in, in, in a, in, and get stuck, like going down the wrong, wrong path of a maze. And then imperative, things we should do all the time. Okay, and there's also a companion series, which is kind of a spin-off, because some of the paradigms are too big to be rules of acquisition, and they were spin -off, spun off into Distinti's New Science Paradigms. There's a playlist for that. Okay, this second rule of acquisition was originally called the wrong answer tell. But then I realized that there's different kinds of wrong answers that we're all calling anomalies, and these are the things we discussed before. And these, you know different types of uh, wrong answers or anomalies can be grouped into classes and each class can have a slightly different way in which you would handle the anomaly. Okay, For example, they could be broken down into two basic classes right now. The first basic class of anomalies are ambiguities. And the interesting thing about ambiguities, they're not necessarily wrong answers. Okay, and we'll discuss those in a little bit. And then the other part is counterexamples. Those are clearly wrong answers. So essentially, an anomaly indicates whether it's a wrong answer or an ambiguity, which isn't necessarily a wrong answer. They indicate that there's work to be done, that we are not finished with science. In other words, if it's broken, it can be fixed or replaced. So in other words, wrong answers can drive progress. Okay, you can't fix something if you don't know it's broken. Okay, and that's why correct answers don't push scientific progress because we don't know there's, there's, a, there's a problem there. However, okay, correct answers can lead to wrong answers. And this is part of the distinct new science paradigms. There's two of them that this, that this is in called the gateway feedback paradigm and the footprint discovery paradigm. Essentially what happens is you have good models. Okay, they, they, they may not necessarily be irrefutable models, they just need to be good models. Those good models allow you to expand your footprint in the universe. Our footprint is our technology, 
how sensitive we can measure, how far we can see with our telescopes, how fast we can travel, how deep below the sea. It's our total capability and knowledge. Okay, so with a good model you can expand your capabilities and your knowledge and your technology. And when you expand that footprint, you're going to stub your toe on a counterexample. Or you could. And that counterexample is then going to give you, this is now the mother of scientific technology, this is the mother of scientific progress. And the feedback part of it is because now what's going to happen is this new model is going to feed back and replace the previous model and this whole cycle starts again. So that's the gateway feedback footprint discovery paradigm. I mean there's, there's two paradigms that this is all kind of conjoined together here. So let me give you an example of the gateway feedback footprint discovery paradigm. There's an old thing called our committee's principle which basically said that the buoyant force acting on a ship's hull is proportional to the displacement of the water. That was discovered by a guy called Archimedes oh, 2,000 years or more ago. And so what, what, what in this particular case we have a ship, a steamship, that has passed this water plenty of times before and never hit the underwater obstacle. And this ship always comes in at a very slow speed because there's no need to run high speed coming into, into shallow waters. Uh, you're just going to waste fuel and then you're going to churn up the bottom creating silt and all that other stuff. Okay, But in the case where you have a pending storm and you need to get to shallow water fast, this ship is going to come in and run aground on something that had never run aground in the years it's passed this channel before. This, this phenomenon is called hogging. It is not anticipated by Archimedes' principle. This actually happened, and the investigation came up and realized that this, this hogging phenomenon occurs, and so now they replace Archimedes' principle with more modern uh, descriptions of buoyancy, which would be Pascal's pressure models along with Bernoulli's principle. Okay, so now those replace the old models and are used going forward. So you see how technological expansion Okay, ships back in Archimedes' days could not go this fast, so this, this did not, could not be seen. It's only until technological expansion, our footprint expanded, that our technology became such that we could move fast enough where this counterexample could express itself. But it would be better to have a way to tell if there is a better model before running into counterexamples and potential disasters. We need a tell. And that's what the, in the old poker game, or in the poker game, you know, you can, sometimes people have these little nervous twitches that tell you that they're bluffing or not. Or you have the weather vane, which tells you which way the wind is coming from, even though you can't see the wind. So what we need is what's called a tell. And the rules of acquisition have tells. So certain parts of the rules, of, some of the rules of acquisition are tells. Okay, and so what we can do is then short circuit this gateway feedback paradigm and use one of the tells to go from a good model through a tell to a new model and bypass this slower process here. And one of the most powerful tells is the seven, rule of acquisition 17, the ambiguity tell, which is an offshoot of this rule of acquisition. And let me give you an example of that. And what you see before you is a representation of a magnetic field. These little, little tails here mean the magnetic field is going down into the page. And it's a time-changing magnetic field. Now, according to Faraday's law, if I put a loop of wire in this changing magnetic field, this is Faraday's law here, the changing magnetic field is going to induce an EMF in the wire that's going to go in such a direction to oppose the flux change in the center. So therefore, using the right-hand rule, we're going to get an EMF induced in this direction around the coil. Okay, fine, no problem. There's nothing wrong here. Okay, remember, we're looking for an ambiguity, something that's not necessarily wrong. Well, if I move, and let's say this, this field goes farther out than the page. So if I move this wire here, that means that the 
electrons or the, the, the charges in this part of the wire are going to go this way. If I move the wire here, that means the electrons in this part of the wire are going to go this way. If I move, put it here, well, that means the, electro the charges are going to go this way. And if I put it here, it means that the, the, elect the charges are going to move this way. So, somehow, depending on where the charges are in the loop, they're each going to do a different thing. So what if I just had a plain old stationary charge sitting there? What it, what's it going to do? It's got to do something. Is it just going to sit there because it's not constrained in a loop? How does it know? How do the, how do the charges here know what part of the loop they're on? That's an ambiguity. That's one of the many ambiguities I found with Faraday's law. Doesn't mean Faraday's law gives wrong answers. This is the key here, but it does mean that Faraday's law is ambiguous. And that's enough. Okay, you don't have to wait for the counterexample. It's enough to go and say there must be a more fundamental, a better model. And that, sure enough, was found. If you go to the foundation series, you can go through the full derivation of how this was found. This is called new induction. Go to the foundation series playlist. There's a bit, long number of videos with lots of experiments and, and, and a computer software to show you how you can arrive at this. This is the new induction model written in legacy vector format. This is the new induction model written in Vortrix algebra vector format. And if you look real closely, you see F equals minus MA. You say, well, what, what, what's with the minus sign? Well, inertia. This is inertia. If I apply a force to a, an object, okay, the inertial force reacting on my finger is going to be the opposite of the direction of accelerating that object. That's the reason for the minus sign. This is inertial force, inertial mass, or inertia. So Niels Bohr said, how wonderful that we have met with a paradox. Now we have some hope of making progress. And this is rule of acquisition 2.0. Anomalies are the mothers of scientific progress. Necessity is the mother of technological progress. This comes from necessity is the mother of invention. Okay, now this is a continuation. This rule of acquisition 2.1 is a continuation of the rule of acquisition 1. In rule of acquisition one, no, the, the, the correct answers prove nothing except utility, which comes from the first part of Karl Popper, which is no number of positive outcomes at the level of experimental testing can confirm a scientific theory. But a single counterexample can show a theory to be false. So rule of acquisition 2.1 is a single counterexample proves a theory wrong, but not useless. Okay, theories can be wrong, but not useless. Getting wrong answers, counterexamples, makes them wrong, but that doesn't mean they can't be used other places. Like Archimedes' principle is definitely a wrong theory or model, but we know it'll work on stationary floating objects. You can you still use it for that. So it doesn't mean it's not useful. And we still say ships have a 550,000 ton displacement or whatever, so we still use it. And we even still use the old Earth-centric model. We still say, when we're teaching navigation, that the sun rises in the east and settles in the west. So just because we can prove a theory not to be the true mechanism of nature doesn't mean we, don't, we can't still derive useful benefit from it. So let's get on with a paradox. Here's an example of a paradox. Scientists are sure that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. Yet here, the universe is full of matter and energy. Okay, think about that one. Okay, I'm not going to go through. This is an ex example of a word paradox from uh, Wikipedia. I put this in while I forgot to eliminate. I don't want to go over this. You can read this on your own. It's kind of cute. Contradiction. Ayn Rand said, contradictions do not exist. I agree with her on this. Whenever you are facing a contradiction, check your premises. You will find that one of them is wrong. And this becomes a set 2.2. A counterexample indicates a wrong theory, model, assumption, or measurement. That's pretty obvious. Okay, getting back to ambiguities, which we covered with Faraday's law. Ambiguities are special in the realm of anomalies in that they do not necessarily yield wrong answers. Okay, and this is true for well, the reason why I went after Vortrix algebra. Okay, legacy vector algebra does not yield wrong answers. The reason why I went after it because it's got missing answers. There's no divide. 
How can you have how can you have a vector multiply without a divide? That's a, that's a missing reciprocity. And that's one of the reasons why I said there has to be a better algebra. And so what I'm going to do is just show you the introduction slide from Rule of Acquisition 17, which basically says ambiguity in a modeler theory indicates that a modeler theory is a special case of a more fundamental explanation essentially from which information was lost or knowledge has not yet been gained. Like in Faraday's law, we have come up with a special case. New induction is the more fundamental explanation. Is there a more fun fundamental explanation below that? Perhaps so. But we need to expand our footprint before we can get there. Ambiguity itself can be broken down into two different classes of ambiguities, but this is really a slide for rule of acquisition 17, so I'm not going to really go over this. So here's some concluding rules of acquisition for the second rule of acquisition. 2.3. The more subtle the anomaly, the more radical is the change to reconcile it. Okay, in Galileo's day they believed that the earth was the center of the universe and everything went around the earth. There was only five little objects in the sky little objects that wandered around the night sky and didn't follow the Earth-centric model. And the astronomers before Galileo's day said, oh, well, it doesn't matter. There are only five little things. And these little wanderers, a Latin for wanderers, planet. When these planets are understood, they'll probably be able to explain within the Earth-centric model or be explained to be something to do with God or something like that. So there's no reason to throw out the Earth-centric model for these five little wanderers because uh, the Eurocentric model agrees with the church and the Bible, and there's no sense throwing all that away just for five little anomalies that don't fit the model. And they, they figured that they would be explained one day, and, and it would be consistent with what their current beliefs are. Okay, but because they ignored those tiny little anomalies, okay, the, those anomalies became the harbingers of catastrophic change when they were finally explained. They had to throw out, completely throw out the Eurocentric model and put in the model that Galileo and Copernicus came up with. And that was very painful for the day. Now here's the other one, 2.4. The more subtle the anomaly, the longer it's going to be ignored. Okay, if you have an anomaly in a scientific theory that you're spending your life you know, teaching and exploring, and you don't resolve that anomaly, you just ignore that anomaly and just ignore like, Like, for example, vector algebra not having a vector divide. I mean, come on with that. You know, how come nobody bothered with that? I mean, it's just like, really? We're just going to ignore this? And so the longer you, you ignore it, the more generations are going to teach this as being irrefutably true, and people are going to grow up, and they're going to invest their entire lives with these models or theories that are one day going to be found to be wrong. And you, you try, you be like an older guy and then they explain that this thing you've been teaching your whole life and you've written papers on is wrong. You're going to be, oh, why come nobody said anything by now? And it's like, well, why didn't you say anything by now would be my answer. You knew of this anomaly, why didn't you pay attention to it and, do, and resolve it? Okay, so stomp out anomalies as soon as you deter, detect them. Do not let them sit. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, I keep forgetting it should be this one.